Good evening, everyone. I'm Eric Spina, the president of the University of Dayton. My pleasure to welcome you here to this very important event and this very important evening in the life of the University of Dayton. I offer a special welcome to members of the Dayton community who've waited a particularly long time for an evening such as this, in which the university recognizes the importance of Mr. Roger Brown to our history and commits to keeping his legacy alive so that many generations forward will know his story, will understand what he stood for, and will learn important lessons, even if uncomfortable ones, about justice. A special welcome also to Roger Brown's teammates and longtime friends. Your presence here enriches us all. The university's honored guests tonight are members of Roger Brown's family including his son, Roger Brown Jr., who is crucial in supporting the university's efforts to honor his father. We welcome you all, and we are blessed by your presence. I want to briefly offer my deep gratitude to the University of Dayton faculty, staff, and administrators who worked tirelessly and extremely thoughtfully to develop and implement the idea of a writer's residency in social justice, writing, and sport as a way to resurrect Roger Brown's memory on campus and keep his legacy alive for years to come in a way that is consistent with our mission, our values, and our Marianne's charism. There are many who have contributed, but I offer special thanks to Andy Slade, Scylla Schindel, Neil Sullivan, Tiffany Taylor Smith, Paul Benson, Tom Wekeser, Jessica Paprocki, Andrea Wade, and Larry Burnley. While I certainly knew of the Hall of Fame basketball player Roger Brown as I grew up a long time ago in Buffalo, New York, I first learned of his connection to the University of Dayton when I came to know renowned artist, educator, athlete, and leader Willis Bing Davis, who received an honorary doctorate of fine arts from UD in 1994 and who I now count as a dear friend and important mentor. In trying to understand some of the complexity of the history of Roger Brown at the University of Dayton, Athletic Director Neil Sullivan and I considered a number of ideas about ways to mark uh, his presence and impact. Nothing quite hit the mark. But then, at a dinner at the President's residence last November for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize authors, our speaker tonight, Will Haygood, and Bing Davis just happened to sit next to me. At the time, an exhibition of work done by some of Dayton's African-American artists, curated by none other than Bing Davis, was hanging in the gallery where we were dining. After dinner, I watched as Bing took Will on a tour of the 25 or so works of art, and I noticed they spent a long time talking in front of this uh, James Pate this extraordinary piece by James Pate, a fabulous local artist of Roger Brown. Where's, and where's James? James, will you please stand? As Bing and Will came and sat down next to me, we proceeded to talk about Roger Brown and his legacy and how he might be recognized by the university. Will, always mindful of the forgotten narrative and the importance of public remembering, said you should establish a writer's residency to make Roger Brown come to life. And that is how we arrived here tonight. You will soon, I promise, have a chance to hear from Will Haygood. But I want to pause here and recognize Bing Davis for all that he does for our community and its citizens, for his role as the animating conscience of Dayton and for embodying Brother Ray Fitz's description of the essence of UD, learn, lead, serve. Bing, thank you for your leadership, for your selfless leadership. And I thought you'd all enjoy this, this picture. So this is uh, from, from left to right. This is Ike, Ike Thornton, who's here tonight, Ike. And Ro Roger Brown is in the middle, number 15. And Bing Davis is that young guy to the right, number, number 11. 
And this is when they played for Jones Brothers Funeral Home. So enough, uh, enough stories. As president of the University of Dayton, I recognize that there are times in the life of an institution in which good people make decisions that negatively impact other good people based upon the information at their disposal or the system in place that much later, through the haze of time and the prism of changing attitudes, policies, and practices, are unable to be understood or reconciled with the values of the institution. So it is, I believe, with the sudden dismissal of Roger Brown from the University of Dayton in 1961. Sixty years later, UD has no records, nor is anyone alive with knowledge of exactly what was known by the New York District Attorney, what was shared by him with the president of the university, or the role the NCAA played. However, there is no doubt that the university's decision was swift and severe, and severe, and the impact on Roger Brown even more so. Picture Mr. Brown, far from home, a young man in a racially segregated town during a period fraught with racial tensions and great power differentials. It literally makes the heart ache to consider how alone he must have felt, indeed, how alone he must have been, and how powerless he truly was to appeal the university's decision or to move on and seek to continue his education elsewhere. His dreams of a college degree and a pro basketball career both dashed. His thoughts about his life, his, his thoughts that his life perhaps would be made a little bit easier by virtue of education and athletic excellence, suddenly and irrevocably erased. Clearly now, from the vantage point afforded to us by time, changing social attitudes and the evolving role of colleges in supporting student success, it would be natural to judge those whose decisions affected Roger Brown's future. Instead, as president, I acknowledge the University of Dayton's role in making more difficult the path forward for Roger Brown and the fact that he deserved better than to be abandoned by the university. Let us make amends for not doing more to support, support this student and seek reconciliation between the University of Dayton and the legacy, family, and friends of Roger Brown by doing something positive, by doing something generative. Mr. Roger Brown, one of the greatest basketball players ever to attend UD, kind and gentle and thoughtful, still highly regarded in the Dayton community 22 years after his death, has been invisible at the University of Dayton. That is neither right nor just. So today, in the presence of Roger Brown's family, as well as friends, teammates, and contemporaries, and with an eye toward justice, we humbly yet proudly establish the Roger Brown Residency in Social Justice, Writing, and Sport, intended to be a lasting testament to Mr. Brown's tenacity, excellence, grace, and commitment to doing what is right. This is long overdue and is intended to begin to make things right with the family, friends, and legacy of Roger Brown. I would now like to introduce Professor Andrew Slade, the chair of the Department of English, who embraced this possibility when it was first raised to him, and who then worked diligently and thoughtfully with many others to establish the Roger Brown Residency as an integral part of the intellectual and moral mission of the University of Dayton. Professor Slade will introduce our keynote speaker, the inaugural Roger Brown Writer in Residence. Andy? So welcome everyone, I'm Andy Slade and I serve as chair of the Department of English here at UD. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Will Haygood. Uh, before I begin, let me just say a couple words about the mechanics. So after the lecture, we will have some time for questions and answers. And I would ask you to pay special attention to this part of the night. A university is a special institution in that it is devoted, at least in part, to questions 
And so these questions after the talk are an important feature of what we're doing, and it would be a shame to miss those, so please do stay. Once we're finished with questions, we will have a book signing in the hall. Will Haygood is an award-winning author, most recently the runner-up in nonfiction for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for his book Tigerland, 1968-1969, A City Divided, A Nation Torn Apart, and A Magical Season of Healing. Haygood, throughout his works, tells the story of America through the lens of history, politics, sport, race, and the lives of, of, and the lives of change-making African Americans. His work has chronicled America's civil rights journey through, the, through acclaimed biographies of Thurgood Marshall, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Sammy Davis Jr., Sugar Ray Robinson, and Eugene Allen, the real-life inspiration for Lee Daniels' award-winning film, The Butler. Will's work, importantly, memorializes the stories that too often have not been told. And as he's been telling students the last two days, he writes books that aren't on the shelves yet. Tonight we will hear Will talk on the American journey of Roger Brown and the challenges of the black athlete. Will Haygood. Well, thank you. Um, since we're here to talk about a great athlete, great man, Roger Brown, and his athletic accomplishments, I thought I'd start out and by telling you a story about my own sports glory. <laughs> but no such story exists. <laughs> I did make the junior varsity basketball team at my beloved alma mater, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, right down the road. But I set the bench. <laughs> down at the far end of the bench. <laughs> However, against Ball State, I broke out of a scoring slump and scored four points. <laughs> Some days I like to think I put a hurting on Ball State. <laughs> no, I never got a varsity letter or plaque or trophy for playing on the junior varsity basketball team. But last year, I was at Miami University during a football game. And at halftime, the school president, and that's Gregory Crawford, and the athletic director, David Saylor, summoned me to the field. I had no idea why. I went out onto the football field. The game was on ESPN2. <laughs> and there was a big package, and they gave it to me. And they asked me to open it which I did, and there was the loveliest, prettiest Miami University varsity letter jacket that you could ever imagine. I must be the most celebrated 
undistinguished athlete <laughs> in the history of Miami University. I have been here in Dayton for the past four days or so. And this community has a sacred relationship to books. I was honored with the gift of a book prize at the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Sharon Rabb, who is the founder of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, is here. She's one of the giants of American literature. In international recognition of authors. Last year, I was here under the aegis of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. And I went around to visit high schools. And I talked to students. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize uh, had gifted students with my books. I'm standing in a line. And I'm signing the books for the students. One student, I think she was in the ninth grade, and she was standing there, and she said to me, she said, I have had to move in and out of about nine homes in the past two years because of family problems. And I kind of half heard her, and I'm signing the book. And then it hit me what she had just said, because she said, I tend to lose a lot of things from all of these moves. And when I handed my book to her, and I said, well, I hope that you don't lose this. And she took the book and hugged it to her chest, to her heart. And she looked up at me and she said, sir, I will never lose this. That shows you the importance of books and what it can mean to a child. Yesterday, I'm at a high school, the Dayton Early, early College Academy. It was First Lady Karen Spina who invited me there. And I'm talking to these kids, very bright kids, very smart kids, eager. And there was a raffle. And they gave me a hat. And they asked me to pull out names of, of the students who would win a book. And there was one girl who was like sitting up front. And her eyes were wide, and she was sitting on the edge of her seat almost. And I had four names to call. And the first name wasn't hers. And I just said, oh, man. And the second name wasn't hers. And I said, well, the third name wasn't hers. And there was another pool left from the hat, and it was her name, and she jumped up like a jack-in-the-box, and she said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> all for a book, all for a book. I've been fortunate in my life to have gotten to have known several college presidents.
they can change the course of a campus's history. They tell everybody how fast a train should go or how slow in the train should go, when the train should speed up. They are the ones who set the course of history for that campus. It is a very wonderful, brave thing in that President Eric Spina has done for the University of Dayton. There's a film, some of you have seen it, about Roger Brown. Some of you are in the film. And I've watched the film. Very well made. But there's also a lot of sadness in that film. There's a lot of tears in that film. And here's what I say tonight. It gives us a wonderful opportunity to wipe the tears away. To start anew. To think of Roger Brown as this triumphant figure. That is not to say that his son or his family members sometimes won't wake up and have a little bit of sadness in their hearts. But this is a good moment now to reignite the entire narrative of the great Roger Brown. He wasn't the first African-American athlete to suffer in this country. This is football season. In 1969 at the university, of Wyoming, the football team was getting ready to play Brigham Young University. Some students at the university said that they were going to stage a silent protest and walk around the stadium to protest the fact that the Mormon church would not accept blacks as priest. The football players heard about that. They went to the coach on the football team and they said, Coach, all we'd like to do is wear armbands, black armbands to support the students and to advocate for racial justice. The coach looked at these 14 black players and said, get off my team right now. All 14 of the players at the University of Wyoming were kicked off of the team. It was heartbreaking and it was scandalous and it was wrong. Six weeks ago, the University 
of Wyoming had all of the players back and they apologized. Fifty years later, they said and, and that they were sorry. On that night, on that campus, the players who returned cried. In the school year of 1968, 1969, an all-black high school in Columbus, Ohio, opened its doors. Several months after Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, the school principal, Jack Gibbs, who was the first black principal there, said the whole city is watching us because we are the only black, all black high school in the city. Jack Gibbs told the students he wanted them to do something special that year. He wasn't talking about sports, he was talking about academics. He wanted more students to go to college in the class of 1968, then in the class, in the class of 1969, and then in the class of 1968. And, but the athletes did something special. They won the state basketball championship in March of that year. Then eight weeks later, they won the state baseball championship. It had never been done in the history of the state, nor has it ever been accomplished again. Two state championships up under a whole lot of stress and strain and racial strife. They had two white coaches. It was Paul Pinnell and there was Bob Hart. Coach Hart's family is here with us tonight. Coach Bob Hart, he got sick. Some people came to the hospital to see him. He said, I do wonder how come I'm not in the Hall of Fame. I don't want to have to wait until I die and then go in there. He said, I wonder if it's because I always coach black boys. Bob Hart landed at Normandy in World War II. He was a true patriot. He came back to college in Ohio and he wrote his thesis on the unfair treatment of the black soldier in World War II. Bob Hart died. A year later, a year later, posthumously, he was finally nominated to the Hall of Fame. I was in South Africa. And there was rumors in that the great freedom fighter Nelson Mandela might be released. And I got up that morning and, my make, and I made my way to the prison where he was being held. Maybe it was true, maybe it was going to happen, maybe it was simply a rumor. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, now it's 7 o'clock, now it's 8 o'clock, and no Nelson Mandela. Not that we would know how he looked because nobody had seen him in 27 years. 
And then a gate started to screech open. You know, like, you know, just the old steel gate. It started to squeak open. And then the gate was open. And there stood a man in a brown suit that looked about two sizes too big for him. There were about 12 people there, and we just looked at each other like, who is that? Who is that? He stood there, and he looked at us across the road, and then he raised his fist. And then we all knew that was the great Nelson Mandela. And I started furiously writing. And I looked down at my notebook, and I could hardly make out the words because tears were falling onto my notebook. South Africa's big sport, rugby. A year after Nelson Mandela's release, sports and race people, a year after Nelson Mandela's release, the Springboks rugby team finally integrated with a black player. And it was Chester Williams who became the first black rugby player in the history of South Africa. That was because of the great Nelson Mandela's his presence. Nine weeks ago, Chester Williams died. He was 49 years old. Some of his last comments were, it has been a struggle. But what did Nelson Mandela do that sent a powerful message out across the world. He started the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Truth and Reconciliation. Those are words that we need to pay attention to in this country. Blacks and whites met and talked about, about bloodshed and about anger and about healing, that all-important word, healing. That is what the University of Dayton is now engaged in truth and reconciliation with Roger Brown and his family. My hope is that every student athlete who comes here to this university now has an opportunity to go down to the courthouse where far too many African-American young men are sitting and awaiting their fate in an unjust criminal system. So we need now to look at Roger Brown as a beacon of light. He joins those figures such as Paul Robeson and Muhammad Ali and Jackie Robinson and Arthur Ashe and Wilma Rudolph. Roger now, Roger Brown now becomes the hope. Roger, now, Roger Brown now becomes the flame that will stay lit. 
There is something on the basketball court, and it's called a blind pass. And being Davis knows what that is. A blind pass is when the offensive player has the ball and he or she happens to be dribbling down court. The people in the stands have no idea what the player with the ball is getting ready to do. But they know because they see somebody streaking, streaking toward the basket. And at the last possible minute, they throw a blind pass to their teammate. And so often, the people in the stands clap wildly because nobody saw the pass coming. It's almost like a trick pass. It sneaks up on you, but it's beautiful when it works. Roger Brown from the grave has posthumously thrown the University of Dayton a blind pass. And the University of Dayton caught it and took it to the hoop. And that's a beautiful thing. There is no Jackie Robinson writer in residence. There is no Muhammad Ali writer in residence. There is no Wilma Rudolph writer in residence. But like the girl said who popped up to get the book. Thank you, Jesus. There's now a Roger Brown writer in residence. So we say to you, Roger Brown, we say to you, Roger Brown, that today, tonight, and forevermore, you are big man on campus. And I thank the Roger Brown's family for being here. And your grace. And I thank all of you for being here. It is an important moment in the nation's history. Because Roger Brown genuinely, genuinely, beautifully has thrown an epic blind pass. God bless you and thank you. Well, thank you, Will. We now have time. We have some time for questions or comments. We've got a mic over here and a mic over here. So if you'd like to ask a question, by all means, I'm sure Will's got an answer. So I want to hear your um, take on uh, um, athletes uh, pay to play, you know, with, you know, with athletes being uh, uh, granted to, uh, to benefit from their likeness and so on and so forth. Comments. Yeah. How come that program didn't start when I was on the junior varsity <laughs> basketball team? <laughs> You know, um, uh, I, 
if it wasn't for the NCAA making all this money, buku money, um, you know, and then not, not always treating, treating student athletes right, you know, and I kind of think, and I probably wanted to stay the old way, but now that has happened, uh, and that some of the money, I think, from their likenesses, right, you know, uh, and I think it's fine, but I don't want, you know, and I don't want people on the team walking around with $16,000 cash in their pockets. You know, I think it'd be good to have student athletes who are, you know, who will be getting that money uh, to take classes in money management. So. Good evening, Will. Good evening. I wanted to ask you. He's in the cabinet. He's, <laughs> a, he's the state transportation secretary. Well, but I, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm, I, I'm here about here to your wonderful words and your wonderful remembrance of Roger Brown. Yeah. But now, we got to ask you, what do you think about the election? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in Kentucky right now, so I'm in Ohio. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, with artists, well, with athletes, they're, they're deified after they're persecuted, after they're gone. What about athletes who speak out contemporaneously, speaking of artists, pardon me, of uh, athletes such as Colin Kaepernick and others who mm -hmm. speak out in these current times, what do you feel about that role? Is that the proper role for the athlete? Does an athlete have a social responsibility or should they stay away mm -hmm. from social mm -hmm. commentary? Yeah, uh, you know, um, I think that it is wonderful what the athletes have done and the black athletes, they are woke. There's no doubt about it. They've always been woke going back to Paul Robeson and then going to Jackie Robinson, you know, it just comes, it just comes with the uniform. If you're black, it comes with the uniform. And these, these guys and women who've been speaking out too, they have nieces and nephews and sons and daughters. And they don't want to look at the news and see that yet one more black person has been shot in the back by somebody in law enforcement. You know, it's been a heartbreaking, you know, three, four, five years of this stuff going on and we're seeing it on TV. And so I think it's a wonderful thing that the athletes have been speaking out, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's needed. There's no doubt about it. It is important and it's, Need it. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, I'm currently a doctoral student as well and actually researching intersectionality of race and sport. Um, so I guess my question is regarding your writing um, and how you go about writing something so passionately um, and then separate, I guess, your, your own views and your own voice, or not so much separate it, but still implement um, the research and the voice of others while also implementing your own voice in there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh And my first editor had said to me, he said, uh, Will, in a book, you have to get into the skull, the S-K-U-L-L, -L, the skull of the person 
who you happen to be writing about. And so I think he was trying to tell me that um, you know, it's very important to bring all, all of the firepower that I have to a book. And I tend to write books. They are the kind of books that I don't see when I go to my local bookstore. I'm not the guy that's going to write the 388th book on Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, and that's, you know, that's just not where I'm at, you know. But if I can find a man who worked in the White House for eight presidents and nobody's ever written about him, uh, now we're talking. And, you know, that's a Will Haygood story right there. Here's this high school. This high school, all black high school. I was literally waiting 10 years, 15 years, then 20 years, then 30 years for somebody to fly into my hometown, some big name writer to fly into my hometown and write that story. And so they didn't. And so I said to myself, well, Will, you're up. <laughs> Sometimes, and I'm down south on stories, and I'll be on a highway, and I'll see a sign that says, Smithfield High School, second place runner-up, state tournament 1991. Second place, and they got a marker on the highway. <laughs> and so the mayor, of my hometown, uh, Mayor Ginther had met with me four months before the book came out. And he said, Will, is there anything that you might want to tell me that might make this soiree that we're getting ready to have for you in the fall slightly better? And I said, well, Mayor, here these guys won two state championships. There's no marker in the city or on the uh, state highway. If they had been white athletes, they might have been on a box of Wheaties. But there was nothing for them, nothing. And there was a big event in my hometown and there was something on the stage, and it was covered. And it was a piece of cloth. And Mayor Ginther pulled it off. Truth and reconciliation. It was a street sign. The street on the side of East High School now is known as Tigerland Way. Those players were there, and they were sitting in the front row. And they all cried. 50 years later, Tiger Land Way. From 1961 to here, Roger Brown. That's the strength of our country, too. We make mistakes, and sometimes we can seem mighty fragile. But there are times also when we can do things that are extraordinarily beautiful. Tigerland Way, Roger Brown, his name attached to literature, that's a beautiful thing. Thank you for coming back and for all that you do to give voice to so many narratives that have uh, gone unheard for too long. 
Um, I'm just curious, given your extensive research on the topic of race and sport, uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Who emerges for you, who has had, who, what, what figure, historical figure, black athlete, has been most impactful to you personally? And then the second part of that is, uh, which historical figure emerges for you who's maybe the most unappreciated in terms of their legacy, their life, their voice? Gee, well, the first part, um, uh, let's see. Athlete. Um, can I name two people? Uh, one is an athlete, and then one is a writer. Okay, is that all right? That's all right. And so the athlete would probably be Walt Frazier, who is a guard for the New York Knicks. Because there was a book that came out, and it was called How to Be Cool and Play Basketball. <laughs> and by Ira Burkow. I saved up money until I could afford to buy it. It only came out in hardback. And they kept telling me at the store, it's not going to come out in paperback. It's an oversized book and has a lot of photographs in it. And I thought I was going to play basketball, maybe for the New York Knicks, and I darn sure knew I was cool, and, you know. <laughs> it seemed to be my kind of book. Uh, you know, but the person who I think helped me sort of link to sports, you know, or link to figures from history and write books. And I was at the Boston Globe one day, and the editor called me into her office. And she said, well, there is a visiting writer at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And we'd like you to go and visit that writer and write a story about him. I said, great, great. Uh, who's the writer? And she said, James Baldwin. <laughs> James Baldwin. And I was both excited and afraid. <laughs> James Baldwin. And I drove up to Amherst and he was staying at, at this farmhouse, and I was walking up on the porch, and the two people who lived there said, oh, hi, Will, go ahead, right in, and have a seat. Uh, uh, Jimmy is upstairs. You know, I'm sure some of you have seen him. He has this way of speaking, you know, he smokes a cigarette, you know. And he came, he came, he came slipping downstairs real fast. Hey, baby, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nice to have you here. Go ahead, start the interview. <laughs> so I did. And I'm asking him questions. At the end of the interview, and I had said to myself, before I leave, and I'm going to get the courage to ask James Baldwin something. At this point, I hadn't written a single book. I'm just living and dying for the space I get on newspapers. Hadn't wrote a book. And I said, at the end of the interview, I said, and excuse me, Mr. Baldwin, can I ask you something personal? And he said, hey, sh shoot, baby, shoot. And I said, uh, 
do you think, sir, that I will someday be able to write books? And James Baldwin looked at me and he said, how the hell should I know that? <laughs> you know, what kind of question is that to ask me? I have no idea who you are and if you'll be able to write books. And my head dropped. Oh, I was so ashamed and embarrassed. And I think he felt it because James Baldwin looked at me after taking another drag on a cigarette and he said, hey, baby, but I'll tell you this, whatever you do in life, you must go the way your blood beats. Students, did you hear that? You must go the way that your blood beats. That phrase hangs over my wall today. They tried to deny Roger Brown an opportunity to make a living. He worked in the factory, but his blood still beat to play basketball. So the man came back with his God-given talents. When you go the way your blood beats, I say that now after nine books working on my 10th, you pretty much can conquer a lot of things when you go the way your blood beats. My blood beat to tell the story of Sugar Ray Robinson because I'd walk into the bookstore and I would not see a major biography of Sugar Ray Robinson. You over there ask me about my research. I like to do research. So I put on some boxing gloves and went to this local recreation center. I said, I want to feel what it feels like to get hit with the glove. Research, and I got hit. And the pain went from the top of my head down to the heel of my feet. And I said, I get it, I get it, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah, okay, it hurt to get hit. It hurts like hell, I get it, I get it, I get it, and I'm on the case, Sugar Ray Robinson. You have to go the way your blood beats. The underappreciated, the underappreciated figure? Uh, Roger Brown, Roger Brown, Roger Brown. There's a question back there. Uh, only because we're both from Columbus, but what high school did you go to? My two varsity basketball letters <laughs> are from Franklin Heights High School. Yes, that was, that was just being formed when I was in school, yeah. Pardon? That was just being formed when I was in high school. Oh, was, okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yep, so that's where I went, to Franklin Heights High School. And uh, you knew Paul Pinnell? Uh, yes, yes, a wonderful man. Isn't he? He's just great. He's yeah. still with us, and uh, he, he's just great. I spoke to him last week. Yeah, I did. Uh, he was the baseball coach, by the way. He was the baseball coach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go a little political on you. Okay. What are your thoughts about so many professional athletes who are winning championships and do not want to visit the White House? You know, um, that is their right. You know, I mean, uh, um, personally, and this is just me, I mean, I don't see how anybody would want to visit this White House under any circumstances. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know, find yourself before the Senate subcommittee, <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, who's, you know, 
There's probably all kind of stuff now going on in there. There's probably all kind of eavesdropping going on, you know. We've seen this movie before, Richard Nixon and Watergate. You know, we've seen this movie before. But, you know, time will tell. Time will tell. Time will tell. People are lawyering up as we talk for good reason. Are there any more questions? How many more questions? Okay. This one, we'll make this the last question. Okay. No pressure. <laughs> one, I want to thank you for the thought that provoked tonight a year ago. As you look across the landscape of the United States and think about the history of our country, what is the thought, the invitation, that other universities should think about as they reflect on their own histories and things that they need to work on towards reconciling? Yeah, yeah. And that was a superb question. Uh, this country has never done what Nelson Mandela did. He had sessions all around the country for people to talk about racial pain. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If hate crimes are up, and they are, if attacks on black and brown people are up, which they are, then obviously something has become unglued in this country. And it's in these schools, I think, can lead the way. Look at Georgetown University. Slaves helped build that school. And now Georgetown has been on a mission to find the heirs of those slaves, the great, great, great grandsons and granddaughters, and give them full tuition scholarships. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And a lot of schools need to look at the skeletons in their closet. Because when you do that, when you open a dark closet, look at the epigram in the movie The Butler. The first time it comes on screen, there's an epigram. It says, only light can drive out darkness. Martin Luther King Jr. That's the first words in the film. And we need a lot of light in this country right now. Roger Brown, in his own unique way, has shown us, has shown us the light. And that is especially what the higher, higher education community can do. It's been a shame that on these southern campuses, these black students and white students who oppose it have had to walk by these monuments which are testaments to terrorism. What good does it do America if we can conquer the moon, Jupiter, Mars, and we self-destruct down here on Earth? All the rockets and the spaceships and the telescopes will mean nothing. If we keep sitting by while people plan on bombing synagogues, it's a tragedy. Too much is wrong. Our land is unsettled. But we can fix it. And I believe we have the strength 
to do so. Lastly, thank you, President Spina. Thank you, Bean Davis. Thank you, Karen Spina. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Where's the other, where's the other Mrs. Brown? Where, where, where? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Ted, thank you very much for your wonderful film. Uh, I thank the officials from my university, Miami University, who are here, Richard Campbell and Phyllis Callahan, and members of my family are here, and Bob Hart's family are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and good night. Thank you, Will, and I'd like to invite Eric Spina back to the podium for uh, his brief talk. Yeah, right down here. Hey, Will. Hey, Will. Eric? Do you need anything? So, um, we said before how p part of this inspiration was a painting by James Pate uh, that was hanging in the president's residence. Uh, so we have a uh, print of that for Will as a thank you for uh, his residency here at the University of Dayton. So thank you, James, and thank, thank you again, Will, for your time at the University of Dayton. It's been highly, highly memorable and very meaningful for us. Thank you. <laughs>